Hi, my name is Kelly Chappelle and welcome to this video about the Gel Electrophoretic Mobility Shift Assay. This video was made for MCDB 427, which is Molecular Biology at the University of Michigan. So what is an EMSA? Well, it asks one central question. Does protein X bind to DNA Y, which is radiolabeled? So EMSAs detect DNA protein interactions through changes in electrophoretic mobility on a gel. Well, what does that mean? There's one big idea, and that is if DNA and protein are bound together, they move slowly on a gel, or at least more slowly than unbound DNA, which moves more quickly. So here's an example of gel. I'm going to point out how to, how to read this. So there are a bunch of lanes here, and there are places where uh, DNA can be loaded, right? Right here at the top. So samples are loaded here at the top. Now these lanes represent places where there's an increasing amount of protein also loaded with that radioactive DNA. So I have a question for you. Which bands are DNA and which bands are uh, DNA and protein? And so specifically what I'm asking is are these bands, do these bands represent DNA alone or DNA and protein versus these? All right, so if you said that these up here are DNA bound with to protein, you'd be correct, and this down here is DNA alone. Why is that? Because these guys move much more slowly on a gel than these. And again, remember that we are moving uh, in this direction. I'll show you the things are moving in this direction. Now here's another question. Are we visualizing DNA or protein on this gel? We are visualizing DNA because remember, this DNA is radiolabeled. Right? We're visualizing this DNA. I'm just drawing the radio label on here just like this, so you remember. This is very important because oftentimes we're asking questions about protein, but what we're seeing in the gel is DNA. So what happens if multiple proteins bind? So this is the case that we saw before as we have increasing amounts of protein, we get an increasing shift towards where the protein was, or where everything was loaded here at, um, at, the, at these wells. But what happens if we have multiple proteins? Say we have a case like this, where we now have this pink protein binding, or where we have the pink protein binding to the protein. So additional protein bound to the DNA at a different spot, or additional protein binding to the original protein. Well, what you get is what's called a super shift, and that's where you have even slower movement on the gel. So this is a comparison of when you just have DNA loaded, where you have protein and DNA loaded, and when you have two proteins and DNA loaded, where this is the two proteins bound, this is the one protein bound, and this is the DNA alone. So a recap is that super shifts can be caused by two cases. The first is where two proteins bind at different sites to one DNA, as shown here, or one protein binds to the DNA, such as this orange one, and a second protein binds to the first protein. So now I'm going to walk you through some examples and a variety of controls that we use when doing an EMSA. So first I'm going to walk through uh, this rel relatively complicated table with you, and I'm going to draw diagrammatically what is on the gel. So this is not what you'd see if you do an autoradiogram, but this is what physically is on the gel. Oftentimes you might be asked a question about what is on the gel, and not everything you see um, accounts for everything that's actually on the gel. That's why I'm doing this. So, First, we're going to look at this lane, where all we've loaded is input DNA. So you can see that if I load input DNA by itself, it runs relatively quickly. It runs relatively far in the gel, so it's down here at the bottom. Now if I load protein and input DNA, and assuming that this protein binds to this DNA, we now have two different things on here. We have the DNA bound to the protein, right, or the protein bound to the DNA, and we have the DNA alone. What happens when you have protein, a specific competitor, and input DNA? And I think that this begs the question, what does it mean to have a specific competitor? And really, what does it mean to have a competitor? So a competitor is another piece of DNA that we add to the equation. And it has two key characteristics. The first is that it's cold. And by cold, I mean it's not radiolabeled. And it also needs to be in excess. That means that we need to have many more competitor molecules than we have on the input DNA. And so if we add the specific competitor, and what do I mean by specific? It means that it's something that uh, the protein binds to as well. If we have many more of these specific competitors around, rather than our actual input DNA, then our protein will preferentially bind to the specific competitor. Not necessarily because it binds better to the specific competitor, but simply uh, probabilistically there are many more competitor molecules around, or put competitor DNAs around.
So when we have the combination of the protein, the specific competitor, and the input DNA, the protein will much more likely bind to the competitor DNA. So they'll have a competitor DNA might, and protein might run somewhere around here. And then we'll have also unbound competitor DNA since that's an excess, as well as our unbound input DNA. And I don't mean that the input DNA will never be bound, but it almost, but relatively speaking, the competitor DNA will be bound much more. So what happens when we have a protein, a non-specific competitor DNA, and our input DNA? So here's a diagram of what might happen with a non-specific competitor. So it's a competitor, so it's going to be cold and also an excess, but it's non-specific. That means that our protein's not going to bind to it. And so when we have a bunch of this non-specific competitor, and we have our input DNA, our protein's still going to bind to our input DNA because it simply doesn't bind the competitor. And so what we have in this lane is we have our protein bound to our input DNA, and we have down here our input, more input DNA as well as our nonspecific competitor, which again doesn't bind to our protein. Finally, what happens if we have an antibody? So remember, the antibody is an example of a protein that binds to our protein. We might be using an antibody to actually verify that the shift that we see due to protein binding to the input DNA is the protein of interest that we're looking for. And what we get is that thing, remember, called a super shift. So we have, uh, again, just our input DNA not bound to anything. We have our input DNA with our protein bound. But now we also have our input DNA with our protein bound and an antibody bound to that protein, causing a super shift. So now I'm going to ask you to draw what you think the autoradiogram is of this exact same setup. So remember, what are we visualizing, going to be visualizing on this autoradiogram? We're going to be visualizing radioactive DNA. And remember, the only radioactive DNA that's on this gel is the input DNA. The non-specific competitor and the specific competitor, by nature being competitors, are not radiolabeled, in, at least in the case of the EMSA. And so we need to be careful that as we look at the autoradiogram, we're only going to see things where it's either input DNA alone, input DNA bound to protein, or input DNA bound to two proteins. So let's ask ourselves, what happens if we just have input DNA? Are we going to see it or not? Well. We probably are going to see this because it's radiolabeled, and indeed, we do. What happens uh, when we have protein and input DNA? Well, both of these guys are, have our input DNA, right? So both of them we should see. What happens if we have our protein, our specific competitor, and our input DNA? Well, remember, in this case, our protein is bound to our specific competitor that's not radiolabeled, so we don't expect to see it. We also don't expect to see our specific competitor all by itself because it's also not radiolabeled. So all we should expect to see is just our input DNA. And indeed we do. Next, what happens if we have our protein, our non-specific competitor, and our input DNA? So remember that our protein's not going to bind to our non-specific competitor, and so it'll bind to our input DNA, which is radiolabeled. We're going to see our input DNA, and we're not going to see our non-specific competitor. So we would expect to see those two bands. And finally, what happens when we have our input DNA, when we have our antibody, and our protein? Well, remember, we're going to see our input DNA, we're going to see our input DNA bound to our protein, and we're also going to see that super shift with our protein bound to the input DNA, as well as with the antibody bound to the protein. So we'd expect to see that super shift. Now, whether or not you see all three bands here depends on relative affinities and concentrations of the protein. Right, so um, it's, it's highly possible that you might actually not see uh, this band at all. Um, for example, you might not see this band at all if you had enough antibody where every single protein DNA complex, um, orange protein in this case, DNA complex has antibody bound. So again, the the whether or not you see this depends on relative concentrations and affinities. So in summary, EMSA is used um, in order to leverage electrophoretic mobility to assay for DNA protein interactions. Remember that super shifts can occur if two or more proteins bind to DNA or bind to each other to DNA. And you can verify which protein is binding using an antibody. Now, if multiple proteins bind, you cannot tell which binds to DNA. So for example, all of these four cases would look exactly the same on an EMSA, more or less. Finally, changing the sequence of competitors, which are, again are always in cold and also in excess, can be used to gain insight into what sequences a protein binds. Other ways to look at sequences of protein binds might include DNA footprinting. If you need to learn more about DNA footprinting, this YouTube channel also has a DNA footprinting video that you could watch.